And um, I think at that point I would hand it over to Jeff to, to take over. In uh, 2007, um, the Marine Carbon Project coalesced. Um, we're basically a collaborative of the major agricultural groups in Marin County. Uh, Marin County is located just north of San Francisco, right on the coast, California, for those of you who don't know. Um, we really wanted to look at this question of what, if anything, could Marin Carbon, Marin, Marin's agricultural community do to mitigate climate change? And we really wanted to look at this question of, of what role agricultural land management might play in, in capturing atmospheric carbon dioxide and then transforming it beneficially into soil organic matter. So um, our group consists of uh, the Marine Resource Conservation District, our UC Extension Office, the Marine Organic, uh, the Marine Agricultural Land Trust. We partner with the NRCS as well. And of course, uh, John Wick and Peggy Rathen on the, on the Cashew Native Grass Ranch. Essentially, you wanted to ask this question, can management enhance carbon sequestration in soils? And then sort of the follow-on question of that was, well, what happens if, in fact, it does? What are the implications of doing that? Of course, all of this was motivated by our growing concern about trends in atmospheric CO2. And this slide is now a year old. We, we crossed that 400 part per million threshold just about a year ago. Uh, looking at some data yesterday suggesting we're at about 402 and steadily rising. As you can see here, what this shows is that we've we've got zero, um, we've never in the last 800,000 years of, of records based on ice core data, we've never had these levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere in the entire time that human beings have been a species on the planet. We've Typically the planet was fluctuating between about 190 and 290 parts per million over that 800,000 year period of record. But in the last few years, literally 50 to 60 years, we've seen this astonishing spike in carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere. And as we know, that's destabilizing our climate system and it's quite alarming, particularly its implications for, for agriculture. So we're, we're operating under the assumption that, that um, the problem itself is a function of our failure to understand the carbon cycle and our role within it. But that by the same token, we're, we're looking for solutions in the management of the carbon cycle and, and asking ourselves whether or not human activity could, in fact, since human activity is destabilizing this cycle, could human activity do something about bringing it back into balance? We're particularly interested in the capacity of soils to act as a carbon sink because we know that soil organic matter is a good thing and that if we increase soil organic matter in most farming systems or most agricultural systems or most ecological systems in general, that there are good, good uh, spin-offs associated with that, that increase in soil organic matter. The really bad news, of course, is that reducing emissions, which has been where most of the political focus has been, um, although absolutely essential, reducing emissions alone is not going to mitigate climate change to the extent that we need to do, do so. As you can see from this graph, uh, that middle line, the hypothetical emissions reduction scenario is really uh, kind of where all of the energy has been going. And um, what we know now is that because of processes that we've already set in, in place with our the warming we've already affected on the planet, that reducing emissions is not going to solve our problem. We do obviously have to reduce emissions as rapidly as possible, but it's not going to be enough. And we need to do something to bring that to bend that line, that rising line, down, as shown in that in red here. The, the really good news for those of us involved in agriculture is that plants have a significant effect on the global atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration. And what you see here is this is the classic Keeling curve. This is data off of Mauna Loa volcano that's been collected since 1958. Um, what you see is each year this intra-annual flux of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere at the rate of about six parts per million. So each spring, as our northern hemisphere forests leaf out and as phytoplankton blooms in the northern Pacific, there's this enormous inhalation, if you will, of carbon dioxide by 
by the newly growing vegetation. And it's so it's so extensive that it actually draws down the carbon the atmospheric carbon dioxide by about six parts per million, which is really quite a huge leap. On the other hand, then of course in the fall of the year we see that CO2 rising again as all of that accumulated carbon dioxide or, or much of it then is re-respired back to the atmosphere by mostly by soil biota as they digest that the, the those carbons those carbon compounds that were provided by through photosynthesis by the plant. So why rangelands? Why are we looking at rangelands? Well, um, rangelands are geographically extensive and make up Oh, roughly 30 to 50 percent of the global land area. They also happen to be the majority of Marin County's agriculture is rangeland. So that's actually where we, we focus. The other key to this is that um, rangelands are dominated by grasses and grass-like plants. And, and it turns out that grasses do a very good job of allocating their photosynthate below ground. So a lot of the carbon that, that grasses um, absorb through photosynthesis ends up being allocated either to their roots or to root exudates or otherwise ending up in the rhizosphere and um, through, the, through the support of uh, extensive fungal networks and, and other biota in the soil system. So it's a, it's a good place to think about moving atmospheric carbon dioxide through rangeland vegetation into permanent storage in the soil. This was our basic uh, initial sampling scheme in 2007. We launched a very extensive uh, sampling scheme in, throughout Marin County, uh, looking at all the major soil types within the county. We really wanted to map out what our baseline carbon content of our, of our soils in Marin uh, might be before we tried to do anything about increasing those levels. And this is what we saw on the right-hand side is the data from Marin County. And on the left is data from California rangelands generally, which we pulled from the literature. Um, on the right, on the Marin County side, you can see we have a range of about 50 to 250 tons of carbon uh, in our soils, in our agricultural soils, our rangeland soils. And in California, we're looking at maybe half that amount, we're maybe 25 to 125 metric tons of carbon, and this is to half a meter depth. Uh, but the distribution is similar between uh, the state as a whole and, and Marin County specifically. What we found right away when we looked at our data from Marin, and again, this is 35 different sites and over a thousand samples, um, we saw that, that we had basically two major groups of soils. Um, very high carbon sites and, and sites with less less carbon. And as we teased the data apart, we realized that the high carbon sites were sites that had a history of having received organic amendments, and most particularly uh, dairy manure, because Marin uh, is and, and certainly used to be a much greater, um, a very important dairy county. And um, so a lot of our better soils have received um, manure amendments over time. And it turns out that that, that shows up um, when, we, when we look at the data here. Perhaps more interesting um, or more important was that when we looked at the data, we found that some of the carbon, some of that extra carbon, was, in, was occurring in very long-term carbon pools, what we call the occluded light fraction and the heavy fraction. So what, what we're looking at with this slide is that, that our control plots and amended plots, that is the, the, the sites that had not received amendments and the sites that had received amendments, um, were seen on amended sites, were seen heavy fraction, recalcitrant car, uh, carbon um, that's, that's less than a decade old. And what that tells us is that management can not only increase soil carbon, but it can do so in fairly short time frames, and it can do so in a, it could, that carbon can be in a form that's going to stick around for a very long time. Prior to this work, we, we had assumed it would take decades or, or longer for, for carbon to enter the more recalcitrant pools, but we actually, through carbon dating, found that that wasn't, wasn't the case. 
armed with this background data, we decided to launch into our experimental work. Um, and we really wanted to, to answer the question of whether we could measurably increase soil carbon on, on marine soils. And then again, to address this question of what might happen if we were able to do that. So what we did in the in the in December of 2008, we hadn't had much rain yet, so we could still get tractors out on the ground. We put half an inch of compost out on experimental plots on John's Ranch in the Cashew, California, in Marin County. But we also replicated the entire experiment up in the Sierra foothills uh, at a more arid uh, rangeland site on the uh, University of California's experimental rangelands in the foothills. Right away in the in the first. Uh, spring, we saw a, a significant increase in forage production, about a 40% increase on the coastal site and about a 70% increase on the foothill site. And what's been interesting, we actually now have six years of data, obviously not all shown here, but we have continued to see this, this, this amazing um, increase in forage, above ground forage production, uh, as compared to our control sites, even after um, six years from a single half-inch application of compost to our experimental plots. In addition, we saw an increase um, in soil carbon. And um, again, that, that increase in soil carbon has persisted um, throughout, throughout the six years that we now have data. Um, this apparent decline is somewhat de deceiving because um, we, we had a, quite a bit of fluctuation in rainfall throughout this period. But the, the very interesting thing is when we plug our data into the century model, which is one of the more widely used uh, ecosystem carbon models, it looks like the soil carbon increase is going to persist for potentially up to 100 years. And again, just to remind you, that's a single half-inch application of compost to our experimental plots. What we see here is three different soils. Uh, the valley soil, the coastal loam, and the coastal sandy loam. But in all three cases, we see a, a persistence of this increase in soil carbon. In the active soil component, the labile soil carbon, as well as the slow or less less active soil carbon pool, and the very passive long-term um, soil carbon pool. Very importantly uh, for California right now, we also saw a significant increase in soil moisture on the compost-treated plots, um, which we believe probably is the primary mechanism driving the increase in, in um, above-ground forage production. But in any case, it was, it was interesting enough that we, um, we took our data to US, the USGS, uh, a couple of soil hydrologists. Um, Dr. Alan Flint and Dr. Lori Flint, and, and gave them this data. And we asked the, the question, what, what, would the, what are the implications of this for California as a whole? Um, and, and the results of their analysis are, are pretty exciting, and they're, they're, they're very excited about it, continuing to do more work on this question. This is a very complex slide, and, and, and you folks will have time to look at this later on your own. So I'm not going to get into too much detail here, but I'd like to draw your attention to the two graphs on the bottom of this poster, what you see on the, on the left is that, that rising, that straight rising line is indicating the anticipated increase in soil water deficit or climatic water deficit in California over the next century. Um, we're anticipating as much as a 5 million acre foot deficit in California's agricultural soils by the end of the century due to, to warming and drying trends across the state. And this is reflected um, in, in this graph, which is a, a model of, of expected climate water deficit increase in the Alexander Valley of California, which is a 30,000 acre irrigated vineyard area. The expectation is that there will be a 2,000 acre foot deficit within that valley by the end of the century. By increasing soil water holding capacity by 25%, which was modeled from our data, that 2,000 acre foot deficit was reduced by 800 acre, foot, acre feet. So we were able to reduce that climatic water deficit by more than a third, modeling that 25% increase in water holding capacity. So for the Alexander Valley today, that would mean a 450 acre foot savings. 
going forward to the end of the century would be an 800 acre foot savings. We, we are really excited about this because we think that as we look at the West and the United States and the, and the drying trends we're observing, we begin to recognize the potential for our soils, our soils to be our primary reservoir and we have not really recognized that opportunity um, in agriculture and certainly not in rangelands until now, I think, and, and the potential for increasing soil organic matter as a, as a strategy for increasing water holding capacity in a drying climate environment is, is very exciting for us. One of the, one of the issues we, um, we wanted to look at was um, what, what are the life cycle implications of the practice, the compost to on rangeland practice? And actually, unfortunately, I see there's a, there's a little data missing from this slide. Um, but essentially, what we're what you're looking at here is is the result of a full life cycle assessment on our practice that was developed by Dr. Marcia DeLonge out of UC Berkeley. Um, essentially, we asked the question: What are the what are the greenhouse gas costs of producing compost? and applying compost to rangelands, and are there greenhouse gas emissions associated with the compost itself? And there are, of course. So um, what you see in, in red are emissions associated with uh, manure ap applications, uh, fertilizer applications, and there should be a little red bar associated with compost production uh, and application as well. That's missing from the slide. Um, in addition, um, there, there are photosynthetic gain associated with the compost application, of course, and the manure and, and um, uh, chemical nitrogen application. And unfortunately, those little green bars are missing from the slide. Um, importantly, though, you can see is the net effect. Um, and the reason the, the, the compost net effect is so great is that in the making of compost, aerobic compost from from materials that might otherwise have gone to anaerobic landfill disposal or to uh, anaerobic storage in a manure lagoon, for example, where methane would be generated. We avoid all of those emissions by, by aerobically composting those materials and consequently we get this very large um, benefit in the, um, in the blue of avoided greenhouse emissions and that's on the order of 36 tons, million metric tons avoided um, in the case of 5% uh, of California's rangelands. So with the emissions associated with compost and the avoided emissions uh, associated with compost productions and the photosynthetic capture of greenhouse gases uh, on rangelands that have received compost, we see a basically a net benefit of applying um, compost to 5% of California's rangelands of about 28 million metric tons. Which is a lot, which is a lot of a lot of greenhouse gases mitigated. If we try to scale this up to the to the whole state, um, the numbers get pretty interesting. Uh, we decided just to look at the 67 percent of California's rangelands that are grasslands and pastures. We didn't see a lot of potential to apply this approach within California's hardwood rangelands um, or in the really arid uh, desert areas of the state, but on the, on the Mediterranean grasslands and pastures of California, which is about 38 million acres, if we were able to implement this practice across all of that land and we were able to sequester only an, an additional half a ton of carbon per hectare, we'd be looking at about 28 million metric tons of CO2 equivalent. As we, as we ramp up to one ton and three tons, you can see the numbers get pretty large. In fact, at the three ton rate, which is in fact what we saw on the foothill site, um, we're looking at offsetting virtually all of the electrical, commercial, and livestock emissions of the state of California. So we're really excited about these results. Um, obviously, there's going to be some, some fuzziness around these numbers, but we're, we're really pleased with what we've seen so far. But even more exciting, I think, is that um, the compost is a great practice and, and, and it's obviously having great effects on our rangelands, but there are a lot of other practices that um, would fall under carbon beneficial, if you will, 
and NRCS has developed a list of about 25. And so we're, we're looking in, at Marin County now of developing what we're calling a carbon farm planning process, and we're, we're in the first year of our implementation of that process. We're working with three farms at full farm scale now, um, looking at all the different ways that we might uh, capture more carbon on those ranches. So that would include things like compost applications, uh, improved pasture management, riparian restoration, windbreak and hedgerow establishment, uh, methane digester installation, all the different ways that we might capture additional carbon on, on agricultural lands and rangelands in Marin. This is what it looks like to um, start to put compost out at scale. Uh, we applied compost on about 100 acres this fall, and um, we're as I say, we're just getting started on that on that overall farm carbon farm planning process. 